Hello everyone, my name is Devin Rue. I'm a professional fantasy cartographer and illustrator in the tabletop RPG industry, as well as your host for the Quip and Quill podcast. My name is Diana Souza and I live in Portugal. I work as a comic book colorist and as a graphic and layout designer. Um, I've colored several critical role projects for Dark Horse Comics, uh, which earned me a nicer nomination for Best Coloring in 2023. I've also done layout for books, like the second edition of Kids on Bikes, and Alice is Missing, the Silent Falls expansion. And I've illustrated character cards, maps, and designed a lot of different materials for fiction writers. You can find me everywhere at Diana Souza Art. And it's a pleasure to be here. I love having you on. I I have to ask, how do you how do you even become a colorist? Like, how does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, until a few years ago, I didn't know either because the comic book world was so far away from everything I've dealt with here in Portugal. Mm -hmm. But basically, what happened at the time was I followed several comic book artists uh, which whose work I loved. And one of them, a colorist, Trina Farrell, she tweeted something like, if there's anyone out there who would like to know more about comic book coloring, just send me an email. And I was like, actually, I would like to know more about comic book coloring. Why not? And from there on, she just mentored me and I colored, I already had some experience with like illustration and Photoshop and everything like that. So we just worked together on like coloring pages. She would send me line art, I would color, and then we'd discuss stuff like, does this work? Does this not work? Why doesn't it work? And things like color theory, you know, what makes a page appealing? And to become a colorist, like professionally, basically you just you build a good portfolio or at least a portfolio of some kind. Right. And then you just send it out to editors and participate in events and stuff like that. In my case, it was a matter of luck as well, I think, because I worked with Trina for several months and then uh, 2020 happened. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was like at home, you know, just well working and, and working and it was just just that. And but I I had finished my portfolio and I was like why not just email it to editors and just, you know, just try. There's a saying in Portuguese which is you already have a no, so why not try? Right? Right. And in my case I was like, yeah. 2020, it was so weird just in terms of everything, you know, yeah. Yeah. just he my headspace and everything. And I thought, well, why not try? I happened to email the critical role editor at the time because because of the first two Vox Machina Origins volumes. Mm -hmm. And a few weeks later, she emailed me back being like, actually, we do have something you might be interested in. And it was, I, I, I hadn't had a professionally published project at the time. Mm -hmm. And she offered me two Mighty Nine graphic novels out of the blue, basically, nice. which was unreal. <laughs> right. I, I, I really thought it was a prank or that <laughs> she somehow had emailed the wrong person. <laughs> because it was so surreal. Imagine just being offered your dream job, like, just yeah. like that. But basically, yeah. long story short, <laughs> that's how you become a comic book color. It's just, you know, you practice, you build a portfolio, you reach out to people, and apparently stuff happens. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, I, I absolutely can, because I made a a bit of fan art for uh, a critical role of the of a uh, Taldore 
and was just like, hey, you know, I had been tweeting back and forth with Matt on on Twitter and stuff and was like, hey, how can I get this to you safely? You know, like, who do I address it to? Like, I was just going to send it to the uh, the address for the studio. I was like, who do I address it to? So, you know, and he was like, oh, don't worry about that. Blah, blah, blah. Gave me the address and everything. And then was like, I was like, well, you know, if you ever need a cartographer. And he was like, well, Actually. campaign two is starting. And I was like, don't you tease me. <laughs> you know, like, don't yeah. you do that. <laughs> Yeah, Toy for me, with my it was emotions. The, exactly. It was, I mean, it was midnight for me. I was just about to go to bed, and I got the email, and I was like, "No, this, this has to be a prank," or right. she just emailed the wrong person because, I, I mean, I don't have any published credits. I just right. sent her her my portfolio, and she was like, "Actually, do you want to work for Critical Role Comics?" So I spent like twenty minutes just staring at my screen, going like. Is this true? Is this because real, right? is this real? Because <laughs> if it is, I mean, yeah, of course, give it to me, please. <laughs> right? How? How? Yeah. No, I um, I ran around the house screaming for a good twenty minutes before I could reply to Matt. Yeah, I <laughs> I know that feeling very well. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, okay, I'm gonna, I'm just, I'm fine, you know. Yeah. And it was just like, and it's funny because. Um, it isn't so much, and I think that that a, a lot of people don't understand that it isn't so much that you're a fan of just like Critical Role and you want to, you know, work with them. It's it, when you become really passionate about a storyline. Like I make the jokes all the time. I fall in love with characters and books on a at a ridiculous level. Yeah, and, I get that. Yeah, and I absolutely fell in love with the characters of Vox Machina and and then Mighty Nine and now, you know. Um, but I so fell in love with the entire world of Exandria. I liked how uh, it wasn't a matter of just like, oh, it was Critical Role and these characters. It was the entire story of the world. I loved the history. I loved the lore that Matt started dropping and because I love to world build myself so when you when you see someone else or meet someone else who has that same kind of level of like I have an entire world's history that I may never be asked about but I still made it <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know it's hard not to be like oh kindred spirit you know and um so even before you know even uh you know, it's not necessarily the show, but, you know, the connection that you have with them as people uh, that makes it so surreal to end up working with them. So, yeah, because by then it was, so it was 2020 and I started watching Critical Role at the end of 2017, I think. And it was already so important to me in so many different ways. Yeah. So, to get to be a small part of it was, yeah, and still is, surreal and amazing. Right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you this question um, because there's a lot of people who think that just you know working with Critical Role sort of sets you up for life, <laughs> and the rest of us know that that isn't true. But there is obviously, you know, a huge jump in like who, you know, your social media and, you know, people that follow you. How big of a difference was it as far as like your the, the number of people that followed you or the interactions you had online or like what was the difference between point A and point B? Um, there wasn't a lot of difference. I mean, I did notice more followers or interactions with like because when Critical Role announces a comic book and tags everyone on Twitter or Instagram or Blue Sky, your notifications just blow up, yeah. <laughs> basically. And I did get some new subscribers from from that, followers, I mean. But um, it, it was incremental, I think. Just over the years, more right. people followed me and I saw some more interactions. But as a colorist, I don't think, I'm, I think it's more noticeable in terms of comics if you are the writer or the artist. Mm -hmm. In terms of 
uh, being the colorist, I didn't really, it wasn't like a jump all of a sudden that and suddenly I had like 10,000 subscribers or something like that. No, I think it was more like incremental, but I did notice because people want to know, you know, to follow the, the artists they like to, and yes. to keep in updated about projects. So every time one of those tweets happened, I would see some changes. Yeah, but it wasn't like all of a sudden I was the most famous colorist in the industry, you know? Right, I, right. It took some time, but it did make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. I um I, I initially had a huge jump when the map was revealed in 2018. And that was that was huge. Mm -hmm. And but after that, like the maps that were shown afterwards, I would ne saw nowhere near like the same thing. Um, the funny thing is, is like I kept getting asked a bunch of questions I couldn't answer, and I think that <laughs> once once people realize, like I can't tell you everything Matt tells me about making a map because some of it never gets revealed because I learn about a lot of the lore, and like when uh, Matt has actually been on this podcast, and before we were recording, we were kind of laughing about there's times where I just. I can't say anything in my own Discord because I can't remember what Matt has revealed on stream yet compared to the notes that I have. And that's still true even of the first uh, of the Dwendalian Empire. <clears throat> so, you know, the first map I made for him, mm -hmm. just because, you know, there's, it just, if it doesn't naturally come up in stream, he doesn't just spew lore out. Of course, yeah. Right. So there's times where I'm like, oh, I, I know where they are. I think I know where they are, you know, and I can't, can't say anything. I just get to go, oh, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> I know something, but it's a secret. Yep. <laughs> and that's it, you know, but uh, yeah, I would get a lot of people ask me that. And I, I think it frustrated people that I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to give up anything, you know. Yeah. I, I got some tweets sometimes of people asking me things like, when would the the other graphic novels come out because right. we announced several of them and there were still like two of them that uh, the, which hadn't been announced and people sometimes would tweet at me be like when will x and y graphic novel come out and i was like even if i knew <laughs> i right. couldn't tell you and right. there was a while there where i knew i, I had I knew the graphic novels were going to come out because I was going to work on them, but they mm -hmm. hadn't been announced yet. So that was a nice little secret to have and keep and be like, yeah, I know, I know a tiny, tiny secret about right. this world and these people, and I won't share it to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and it's but, so funny because you want to, but you don't at the same time because it's yeah. just, it is so precious neat to watch the the critter community explode. Yes, it's it it's just I love it. I love it so much. There's so uh, much enthusiasm and just cheer joy. Yeah, which I appreciate, and I I'm there as well. I mean, I'm there. Oh yeah, <laughs> I was a critter before I was. You know, I yeah. worked with them. So yeah, absolutely. Still am. Watch every Thursday night. Uh, Same. I, Actually, yeah. Friday morning because you know I must. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I watch half of it. So I draw for the first half. And then once they go mm -hmm. to break, I usually turn it off, at least right now, because unless there's like a really good fight or something happening, then obviously I keep watching. Um, but part of that is because I end up, I I have found that on Thursday nights, I don't sleep as well if I'm all mm. wound up. I wonder why. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> so I try to watch the mystery. second half. Yeah. It's so weird. But that happens. And, but weirdly, not on the last, well, no, that's not true because I watched Candela uh, Obscura as well. So, yeah, that, yes. that still winds me up. But, um, <laughs> in a different way. Yeah. It's such a good show, too. Oh, yeah. But I absolutely watch that on Friday. I don't, I don't watch on Thursday nights because I <laughs> will have nightmares. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I oh, that stuff's why. a little graphic. Yeah, I was like, oh, I, but I love it. Oh, it's so good. Yes, so good. it is. The uh, atmosphere is just, yes, this is what I want. Please, just in terms right. of storytelling and role playing and just everything. Oh, yeah. And the costuming. Yes. And the, and the set as well. 
Oh, it's just it gorgeous. Moves, and there's oh, just yeah. it, amazing work from everyone involved. Oh yeah, yeah. I I'm so excited to uh, see Liam at the helm. Yes. Oh, he's so good at, oh, at the creepy stuff. Tonight, right? <laughs> yes, it's yes, today. it does. It's Thursday. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I will be watching it tomorrow. I will be gaming tonight with nothing that is that terrifying because I'm really <laughs> afraid of Liam. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, he's uh, he's really good at at uh, psychological uh, storytelling and just like really creeping me out in a way that like Talison can be super creepy and I love it. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt is also like really good at just like doing some very classic uh, uh, horror storytelling, but Liam, Liam takes things to whole new depths to stuff. And, yeah. um, I've had the joyous pleasure of, of working on a project with him where he, he, uh, yeah, he let me know the level of detail that he genuinely thinks about his stories and stuff that I was like, holy shit, I don't, I don't want to be in your head ever if I can help <laughs> it. <laughs> you can see it sometimes in just the, yeah. the details he shares like very casually, but right. you, can, you can see there's been a lot of thought behind just little gestures and words and oh yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 impressive. On top of all the work he does, like I mean, yeah. all of them. You know, like it, the I know that it's Matt's job to build this world and everything, but he still has other things that he does in the company. And in his life and voice acting, you know, so the fact That's that it's impressive. like, right. It's like, do you sleep? Probably you know? not. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, do we they all have them? warlock packed so they don't right. have to sleep. And uh, I need one as well, please. Right. I only sleep six hours a night and I still feel like I would like to not sleep as much. I wouldn't, I wouldn't function on six hours of sleep. <laughs> I've always been this way. It's, uh, I sleep six hours a night in three hour intervals with about two to three hours of being awake in between. <laughs> I just, my sleep schedule is not a schedule. <laughs> right. I wake up a thousand times and I don't sleep properly and it's a mess and there's no way to fix it. So, you know, you just right. keep going. <laughs> Yeah, no, I uh, I usually fall asleep um, between midnight and one o'clock, wake up at three or four, play on my phone or go do something for an hour or two, come back to bed about six and sleep till nine and I'm good to go for the rest of the day. And I've always been this way and it's super fucking frustrating to everyone in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I need my sleep. I can't get it, but I need to sleep and rest right. because right. just, yeah. My wife is really good. She has, it took her a long time to get used to the fact that I will just be awake. She falls asleep. I'm awake. She wakes up in the middle of the night, maybe to go to the bathroom. I'm awake. She gets up in the morning. I'm awake before her. She's like, do you sleep sometimes? Probably not. <laughs> Has anyone yeah. ever seen Devon sleep? Probably right? not. You know we that. don't have proof. Yeah. I mean, for all she knows, I'm a Cylon. I mean, could be. Yeah, yeah, just charge my battery every once in a while and I'm good. Yeah. Yeah, so... <laughs> I mean, I, I would take that as well. I mean, and just keep working <laughs> because right. I'm an overworker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can't... I, but it's so, because I also love my work. Right. In terms of everything I do. Right. I do want to absolutely state, because I get this from a lot of people and they're like, you know, the whole like... Get find a job where you're doing what you love and you never work a day in your life. That isn't mm. true. Yeah. I work every day of my life. Um, it's still work. It's just I enjoy the majority of it. Yeah. There is and always going to be still, parts you don't like. Yeah. And you can still get tired and exhausted and yes. burn out from doing stuff you love. Exactly. So please rest and take breaks, everyone. <laughs> 
Yeah, find find something that you can do, even if it is work related. You know, if you're like the rest of us who feel really guilty that you have time that you should be working and you're not, yep. find something else that you really enjoy that can be work related. Although technically, it's okay to take breaks. It is apparently, yeah. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard that too. I don't necessarily do. Although technically, this is me taking a break. <laughs> Well, technically. <laughs> right, right. I was like, I'm going to make it. So I, I, I made the podcast just to essentially have an excuse to message everybody. And look, look, here's an excuse for us to talk and we can pretend it's work related. So therefore, we'll actually do it. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I get that. I've done the same a few years ago with surprisingly comic book people before mm -hmm. I started working with comics. So I think my brain was just preparing myself right. for, you know, I like comic books so much already that, I mean, for me, it was surprising that I got, uh, that I started working as a comic book colorist, but looking back, I don't think it's that surprising that I ended up in comics anyway. Right. Because I was already immersed in the world and was interviewing comic book people and just the whole thing. Same, same. I, like when I look at things, when I look back at everything now, I'm like, how did I not do cartography years before I actually did? Because as much, you know, literally because I've been a DM for so long and I've made so many maps and everything else i did mm -hmm. artwork you know i've always had um an art career of some sort even if it was just part-time and on the weekends but it wasn't maps <laughs> yeah so you know but i've been making them for my group forever yep yeah, same i've been yeah. writing like homebrew stuff for ages and i only considered like posting a couple of things online a few yeah. years ago, but I've been doing it forever and drawing maps and drawing NPCs and all of that. But it was, it was like my, I didn't consider that I could do it right. for other people. It's Our brains can be strange little creatures. I mean, you know, when, when career day comes up in school, fantasy cartographer is never yeah. one of them. Never, which is surprising. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think, I, I also think the other thing is, especially um, because we're all always told, like, you can't make a living just playing games or just being involved in gaming. This is so drilled into us as kids um, that yeah. it's not a real career. Even just art, you know, not specifically yeah. gaming. You know, you're told, you know, you'll never make, you know, you can't do this as a career. You'll always have to do something else along with it. Um, and that it's not a sustainable, you know, uh, livelihood. And then that's not true, or at least not anymore. I don't, you know. Yeah, I don't think. Pre-internet, yes, that was absolutely true. And even f some people made it, but it was a yes. lot less people, right? Oh, uh, yeah. But it but even, even like when I went to university and everything, um, people thought that the, because here in Portugal, when you go to high school, you have to already choose like an area of things that you like the subjects right. that you have. So you have a, the exam you need to get into university. So mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to go into multimedia, which is like, graphic design and video editing and web design. So all the things like what I do these days, because I love to multitask, even in my work. And um, even then I had pretty good grades and everyone told me I should go into architecture because it was the only way I would make money in arts. Oh. Which is, it, it isn't true, right? I mean, right. it isn't, it isn't true. Uh, but. Even then, it was the way people thought. I mean, architecture, or you won't, you won't do anything. Right, right. It'll be something you do on the weekends and part time, yeah. and you'll have a real job, quote unquote, during the week. Yeah, exactly. And and even I mean, 
graphic design when I got to university it was it was a bit different but even then there was like this idea that it wasn't really a job I mean not from the people right. at the university and my teachers and colleagues but people who asked me what my degree was and I would say yeah graphic design and they were like is that illustration right. what is that and when I explained, they'd be like, yeah, you won't get a job after university. <laughs> I think a lot of people have a hard time understanding how how you can be able to sit at a computer or, or you know, at, at a canvas or whatever and create all day long. And somehow somebody's going to pay you for something that they see as not as... Um, Oh, I don't want to say that like it, they don't see it as work, although uh, I'm sure Some a huge version of them actually. do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like, yeah, I think there's a lot of people that are like, how do you, how on, how many people could possibly want to pay you to make a map mm -hmm. of a fictional world? Yeah, well, and if you're having fun working, then it's not a job. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, my my wife had to get used to when her and I when I really started taking off and um, working a lot of hours and everything else and this is technically even before Critical Role so afterwards it was it was pretty chaotic mm -hmm. um, she would get a lot of people that would just assume that they could come over our house and hang out or that they whatever that I could just drop whatever it was I yeah. was doing to accommodate them or their schedule and I'm like no no I I actually I know that I work from home and that a lot of you seem to think that I just scribble all day long <laughs> yeah, and somehow get paid for it but first. yeah I have deadlines I have things that I I absolutely have to accomplish yeah. in a day and it is a job as much fun as it is for me it's still a job yeah I had people who thought I could just choose one to work which is technically true but I still have to sleep and I have deadlines so you know I still have to work x hours per day so if someone decided to stop by I would have to compensate and work through the night but even now I've worked as a freelancer for 10 years or more and even now there are people who just don't quite understand why I'm why I'm working all the time because if I'm a freelancer surely I can just stop working and go right. have lunch for three hours <laughs> right and not have it affect yeah your day and the funny thing is like I, I try to stress this with a lot of people when they do ask about doing this for a living or getting into it um, the amount of work that you do directly correlates to how much money you make Mm -hmm. like yeah. it, it, to the point where you know um and it is one of the reasons why i talk a lot about you know having a form of passive income to help pay with the bills and stuff because that's something that you can rely on where it doesn't require you to constantly be working at although technically it does require you to do mm -hmm. marketing and socials yeah. um but you know like i when i was sick for over the past four years i actually um was having a lot of health issues and I just I just couldn't really produce the art that I normally would have and finally have been able to pick back up doing and uh it was it directly affected my income and I try to explain this to other people who just I know that they see certain things like, oh, you have a Patreon and you have like, you know, X amount of members or, you know, and you're working with Critical Role. So, of course, you've you've got hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> yeah, we are all millionaires. It's true. Right. right. <laughs> and, uh, oh, and, you know, and you do work with, you know, Wizards of the Coast or Magic the Gathering. So clearly you're making money. And I'm like, well, yes, I am making money, but these are one off payments that don't sustain me for an entire year. And while yeah. I'm doing those, I can't do anything else that I could share or that I could use on socials and it ends up affecting it. So you, a lot of us end up doing twice the amount of work, some that we can share and then some that we have to under NDA until it's released. And it just yeah. makes all of this really difficult. And 
and at times incredibly stressful. <laughs> it is, yeah. And you were talking about being sick, and I have a I have a chronic illness yeah, for same. for like ten years, so I've had to adapt because sometimes I'm going to feel worse, and my chronic pain is going to flare up. And I still have deadlines, and I still need to work and pay the bills. But I, I also have to know my limits because if I push those limits and if I try to compensate too much, I will just get worse and worse, yes. and then I will not be able to work at all, you know, and not make money and miss deadlines and stuff like exactly. that. So lately, I've been trying to be better at that and like take weekends off which is you know an idea a weird idea yeah um for years i did i barely took weekends off and then i burned out because mm -hmm. that's what happens <laughs> yes yes it does um i kind of did over over the um so unfortunately during the beginning of the pandemic For the first four years, uh, I we're, we're going on year five now. Year whatever it is, oh, feels like forever. Time is a weird soup. You know? Oh, it's, it so definitely is. <laughs> um, but I found uh, the um, I was having a, an allergic reaction to the water where we lived. Okay, well these are just strange. <laughs> right. Well, apparently there is acceptable amount of arsenic levels. Oh, yes. And um, or, or, you know, something similar. There's also very uh, there was a lot of uh, metal in because we had our water mm -hmm. tested and everything. And it was costing us a ridiculous amount of money to put in like full house filters. But, you know, imagine every time you take a shower, you walk out and it's like you have an all over sunburn. Yeah. 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 No, no. So I was going no. through that for four years almost during the beginning of the pandemic. So yeah. I was not really feeling very creative. Mm -hmm. And I can uh, imagine. Was, right? Uh, I, unfortunately, some people can't and were just really annoyed that I wasn't um, going to do uh, commissions for everybody. <sighs> I just, I just couldn't. Uh, you know, uh, and then on top of it, because I am from New York and um, I grew up in, um, uh, I grew up in an interesting situation. I'm going to put it that way. Um, but, you know, when the whole Black Lives Matter movement rose again, um, mm -hmm. there was, uh, I'm very strongly connected to my neighborhood in New York, even though I don't live there anymore. And, uh, you know, it, it was so hard because, you know, you call up your friends and even though you're not there and, and they're out there protesting and, mm -hmm. you know, screaming on, on, you know, and, and getting enraged and we all could absolutely feel it. So now, you know, yeah. on top of that, I'm watching my, my friends and family from my old neighborhood, just absolutely you know, feel like they're being crushed underneath, you know, society's oppression. And, you know, that's just It's a lot. Yeah. So, you know, the world has been a lot. And that yes. affects everyone, I think. So, you know, we had talked a little bit about this before, but I really, really want to ask. So um, you were involved in a little bit of controversy. Mm hmm. And, um, During, uh, well, I'll, I'll let you fill in any details that you want, <laughs> um, but I'm really curious. How do you ever get? Oh, how do you ever trust working with somebody after all of that happens to you? How do you ever like? How do you come back from that and feel okay with anyone <laughs> approaching you to do a project? Um, I think. First of all, it taught me to trust my instincts more mm -hmm. because even before everything happened in 2022, I think it was, mm -hmm. um, there had been some signs 
and some behavior that I had been like, well, maybe this is just how the industry works and maybe I have to do this because that's how you make it in the industry and right. stuff like that. And I, I'd already been thinking that maybe that that wasn't true because I was feeling so tired all the time. Uh, but I think it's a matter of one, trusting your instincts, but also communication, just like open, honest communication with the people you work with. Because mm -hmm. after all of that happened, I started working with another company and the way the people behaved and treated their colleagues and freelancers was so different. Like so, it was a world of difference. They would show me so much more respect and I was like some of it was like I'm not saying it's my fault because it, it isn't it absolutely isn't but I right. have a lot of imposter syndrome so I was like why am I working for this company and they will figure out that I don't know anything and stuff like that and I think the people I worked for took advantage of that but right. with the new company I started working with a all times, all steps of the process, they would check in with me, they would ask if it was all right, if I had time, if I could do this, and if I couldn't, they would adjust deadlines, they would adjust whatever I needed, and if I needed help with getting uh, certain files, for example, or information, they would just respect and help me. Right. So I think it was so different uh, that I felt that I could, that I could trust them. And right. it, it actually wasn't the first time that I've worked for a company that was mistreating their employees and their freelancers. So oh. since it was the second time, I, I just got like tired and I, I hadn't, you know, I, I sat down and I thought a lot about it because of course I, I just, I had to after everything that happened. Right. And it, it was a matter of just trusting myself as well, as in, I don't deserve to be treated this way. Right. So if someone starts treating me this way and saying certain things and showing certain types of behavior towards me and my colleagues and everyone else in the industry, I should trust what, I, what my first reaction is and maybe not work with them. But the right. people I'm working with now in several different projects and mediums and industries, they are so different from that, that I, I, I think, and I, for now and until now, they've, they haven't shown me otherwise that I can't trust them because they treat other people with respect. Sometimes it's as simple uh, as that. Yeah. So, uh, for anyone listening, um, we are being purposely vague. Um, it is as much as um, you absolutely should call out people for bad behavior and everything else. This is something that's that happened a couple of years ago. Um, and there is always a fear in this industry of people retaliating, especially if they do have a name much larger than yours or whatever, but also just because nobody wants that stress. Yeah. So I am going to ask anyone that's listening, please don't tag me or uh, Diana and ask who this is about. The answer, <laughs> we're not going to tell you or else we would have just stated it on the podcast. But it it's also for uh, our sanity. It is really hard when you are involved with someone else who is a bad actor in this community it does feel like somehow you're involved you know mm -hmm. like like it's gonna you know uh, reflect negatively on you even if you are one of the victims um and the other thing is it it you just want it over <laughs> yeah and the you thing know is, i'm actually quite proud of the work i did for that company and for mm -hmm. those projects there was one particular project where I was basically the art director of the whole thing. And I still love what I did. 
right. and it might never be published but you know i would just rather and those people were called out at the time very rightly so right um but you know sometimes the consequences don't you know reflect <laughs> right the actions right. there's yeah. just there's just so much that <clears throat> And if people like go to my portfolio or just Google it, they'll probably right. figure figure it out. So right, but you know who who wants to like reinvite the drama by of naming course. names or or ha rehashing the whole thing? And also because it's technically not the point of us having the discussion. It is talking about so when this stuff happens, how do we come back from it? How are we okay mm -hmm. with it? You know. And how do we, like, especially if it is something that we're super proud that we had done the work with, um, how do we share that? You know, like, how do we go like, oh, I, I made this really neat thing. And thankfully enough, most of the stuff that I've had, because I've unfortunately have worked with people with in controversy. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. thankfully enough, um, I, I can separate what I've created from anything that I've collaborated with. And uh, I learned that really early on, that if I'm going to collaborate with somebody, I need to be able to have my art separate from it. Or mm -hmm. else I will be dragged down with them because people. <laughs> yeah, people. In this case, it wasn't completely possible, but, you know. Right. Yeah. Right. But so, I think you know. it's a matter of, you know, just don't let, sometimes you can't avoid it, but don't let people disrespect you. Especially if you're working as a freelancer for someone and, you know, if they call you at like 2 a.m. screaming that it's an emergency, uh, maybe, maybe don't do the thing because you feel pressure to because they'll just keep doing that. <laughs> right. You know, there are certain like environments, work environments that mm -hmm. you should, I, I did, I knew it, but I also... When you're in the, situ the situation, it's hard to eradicate yourself from it. Right. Because you think you're being uh, subjective. When right. a lot of people from the outside were already telling me that it wasn't a great situation. <laughs> and right. that maybe I shouldn't do some of the things I was being asked, you know. Uh, but yeah, it's hard when you're in the middle of the situation. But just know that... One, it's not your fault. Even if you do agree to do certain things, sometimes it's because of pressure and because, you know, it's just... It's what it, really what seems hard right to say no. Yeah, it is. But uh, it's you not don't your want fault. to say no? Yeah. And, it's, and, if you, and if you feel something like this is wrong and they're disrespecting me and all of my colleagues as well, maybe, you know, just... Take a step back and ask someone who is impartial their opinion and weigh the options. <laughs> I think a lot of us are terrified to say no. Mm -hmm. I think that we're yes. afraid to not be seen as a team player mm -hmm. um, or to feel like we are the reason that a project ha isn't moving forward or isn't, you know, uh, um, reaching its potential or whatever. Um, but uh, I'm going to stress this as, as nicely as possible. It is never your job to carry somebody else's project. Mm -hmm. If someone else creates a project and it, it, is, it isn't meeting the deadlines they set or the expectations they set, then that's on them. It isn't your fault. It isn't your problem. It isn't, you know, like you have, these are things that you have no control over. And therefore you're not the reason that it's not working or that it's not meeting up to whatever expectation. Here, here. Right. And if someone is telling you, like, if you say no, or if you don't do this, the project is going to fail. And then we don't know what's going to happen to the company or the project is late because of this person or that person. And this is terrible and everything is terrible. That's a red flag. <laughs> yes. 
that is on them. That's that's bad yep. pro, uh, project management. That is bad communication with other freelancers or other employees. That's them entirely. Mm-hmm. Um, as a freelancer, and and um, the, hopefully I get to have a, um, a, a, an episode talking about creating contracts, which is soon to hopefully be coming. Yeah, because it's important, um, and no one teaches you how no. to interpret and read contracts, or how to ask for certain things to be yes. added. Like there's a a big thing with me. One now, all of my contracts specifically state, like if there's any AI used in the project, that I should, I need to be informed beforehand, mm-hmm. and that that is my out. I won't. I don't want to do a project that has any AI involved yeah. in it. Um, until those ethics and laws and stuff change, that's just the way I feel. Um, but what I I now do is, even if someone goes to send me a contract, I'm like, okay, that's great. Let me send you a copy of what I normally have in mine, and before you send me yours, and you can kind of compare and then add whatever is missing out of one. And I always will highlight things that I absolutely um, won't negotiate on. And it's a very nice and polite way of saying, hey, these are these are my conditions and this is how I work with other people. And if, if you can't meet this or you can't do this and we can't negotiate on something, then unfortunately I can't do the project with you, which mm-hmm. sucks because all of us want to say yes, because, you know, every project is is one more rung on that ladder and, and one yeah. more, you know, one more bill to pay as well. But you know and sometimes they're really just like cool projects that you want to be a part of right yeah but you also have to respect yourself and your boundaries and it's work right yeah. you work your work you might be working for something you really love and you really like but that doesn't mean people get to abuse your love for the project right and your willingness to work there right. has to be respect in both directions. Exactly. And, you know, the other thing is, um, don't automatically assume that if somebody doesn't have something in, in their contract or doesn't say something that they're purposely trying to fuck you over. Yeah. A lot of times, especially when I started working with much smaller companies, uh, um, they didn't even know what to add to their own contracts. And uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of us never sign contracts when we very, very first start mm-hmm. because we don't think about it. <laughs> you know, you're just like, oh, I yeah. just want to be a part of this project. Yes. You know, yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, you it only takes a couple of times of you like not getting paid or not having something happen. And then you're like, OK, can we have a contract? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need this in writing, you know. Um, a, a perfect example of that, it, of miscommunication was I had a company that contacted me. They wanted to make a product featuring some of my art. And I was like, yeah, sure. Not a problem. We started talking over everything and then, uh, we actually made it. And then sometime later, um, they wanted to make something similar, you know, but with a different design. And I was like, okay. And they're like, oh, so, you know, with all of our other artists, we have, you know, such and such, you know, set up. And I was like, no, no, that's, that's not how that works with me. And if you like, I will pull up our emails and because I keep a, a a log of everything. Um, I'll pull up our emails and, and tell you, you know, show you the actual conversation we have. And then I was like, speaking of which, before we do this this second project, I'm going to want a contract now because you basically told me that you would like to use my art indefinitely mm-hmm. <laughs> without compensation. And I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, and that's not, I mean, that, that sounds a little harsh. That's not exactly what they meant, but that is, you know, um, how those types of contracts work. So I sent them a copy of mine and uh, we kind of negotiated and worked it out. But, and they didn't mean it as in like, hey, we're trying to fuck you out of any royalties. They just meant like, we couldn't remember what we had with you with our last project mm-hmm. and considering it was so different than 
their other artists that they've worked with, they were like, "It do, is, are we doing this with you? It's, no, no, but thank you. You know, so I, I don't automatically assume someone is trying to fuck me over. And also, I will eventually have, like I said, an episode where I really talk about the legalese. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of people read into contracts and don't realize what what they're reading. You know, um, yeah. such they, they, as... Companies just have to protect themselves, right? <laughs> right, right. And especially, freelancers. Yes, it, especially. Like, it, this is a reason why I'm like, oh, we need to talk contracts. Um, because, you know, a perfect example is there's... It is extremely common that if you post something on any social media or any website at all, that... Um, if you read their terms and conditions, it's in, it's extremely common that they'll say something like anything you post on their site can be used without compensation as advertisement. Mm-hmm. And what they mean is they're just going to show the post you made. Yeah. You know, they're not they're not stealing the image off of the post you made and using that in advertising. They just mean they're going to show that you, you know, but... Because the way it's worded, you could absolutely read it as in, oh, they're going to take my artwork off of my post and use my artwork for their advertising without compensating me, which they can't do. You can absolutely take them to court for that. Nobody can use your art and uh, imagery without your permission Um, Because as a creator, you hold the copyright, even if you are work for hire. Yeah, even if a company holds some of the rights, if they didn't give permission, it still applies. Right. And, you know, so there's, you know, it's, it's a little difficult to understand. And I totally get that, Um, especially when you first start and... So I'm I'm hoping to actually have a couple of episodes where I really get to dive into um, contracting and how to how to negotiate politely because all of us again are afraid to say no or to you know rock <laughs> or the boat or anything. Yeah, yeah. So like you know adequate pay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I recently signed a contract with. A company I I can name them uh, because right. you know uh, it was 14 pages long. It was really scary legally talk, and yeah. you know it can be really scary when you read all of that and you're like I don't understand half of what's written here. But it's right. really useful to just learn that as a freelancer because I didn't I mean I didn't have subject in university or high school or anything like that that taught me how to just you know read those contracts and how it works and what can be done in terms of changes and negotiation so i do think an episode about that or two episodes (laughs) would be really really (laughs) helpful yeah yeah yeah, I'm hoping to have quite a few that'll that'll be dotted in between me actually bringing guests on and stuff. I'll be and, here uh, listening. <laughs> he, um, you know, the funny thing is, like, um, I didn't, I didn't think about when I started doing this. Um, I didn't think about how I immediately asked for contracts. I I immediately knew, but. Um, It is because, like I said, I come from a corporate background. I have a really good understanding of business and everything else. I don't think that it ever dawned on me when I first started that it wasn't the norm to negotiate or ask for different prices and stuff like that. Um, I also, but at the same time, like I way underpriced myself because I wanted my name associated with projects. I've never done that. Nope. No, no. no never, no. ever, ever. No, uh-uh. I don't know what that's like. <laughs> right? What but a strange what? concept. 
right? Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Like almost basically doing it for free at mm -hmm. some points, just so you can have your name on it. And I will never ever make someone feel bad for that or like, oh, you shouldn't do that because we all have. Yep. And at times it's made a huge difference. Um, some of the projects where I got paid next to nothing or actually nothing led me to other projects where I get paid very, very well. Yeah. So, yeah. and the gaming industry is tiny. The tabletop industry is a tiny portion of the gaming industry. Yeah. So, you know. And sometimes, I mean, I mean you just have to weigh your options, right? I mean, you can do some projects that will pay you not what you're used to being paid maybe or maybe you'll just choose to do them for nearly for free mm -hmm. it's just a matter of weighing your options and if it's worth it you know i'm not going to guilt trip anyone for doing that because i've done it <laughs> right you know it's just part of the and i've done it even after being quote unquote established right oh yeah same same so it's it's not something that I'm going to say, no, never do it, don't do it, because it, it really depends on the situation, as long yeah. as you're aware of everything that entails, right? Right. Yeah, I uh, I actually want to, um, because I didn't know, uh, again, when I started doing this, I didn't, I didn't know that people don't know how to look up how much a company is making or a, a way to literally investigate a company, uh, even a tiny company, to get a better understanding of what they're asking of you. Um, and a, a great example of that is, um, oh, uh, um, oh, I can't think of the name of the company, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had somebody uh, a couple years ago had asked me whether or not I wanted to work on a project with them. And I was like, oh, I was like, you know, do I have to answer you like right away? They're like, no, I was like, all right, <laughs> let me see my schedule. And meanwhile, I absolutely was going over the internet and scouring to figure out who they were um, because they came to me with a pretty low price. And I was like, I, I don't know if I should say yes, because they're a tiny company. Maybe they can't afford anything. Or so I just, in, you know, looked them up online and found out who they were and was like, is this your is this your normal pricing for your other artists and because this is how much i actually charge for what you're asking and they're like oh oh okay in that case yeah no we'll pay that we just we've just never hired a cartographer before oh okay great you know but they had like a really tiny following on twitter that and that's how they contacted me so i would have been like oh you know anyone else i didn't realize a lot of people were like oh you have like what 100 following on twitter you're really tiny i shouldn't worry about it meanwhile they're a rather large company and i was like oh no you could afford more <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i've had in big huge companies offer me very bad rates and yes. i was like i know you can afford to pay me more but you're just trying to get away with it <laughs> right and i'd be like you know it's an industry st uh, standard that we charge X for this. So can you do that? And I, I knew they could, but sometimes, I mean, it doesn't depend solely on the editor or, you know, right. there's so sometimes much. Sometimes it's involved. the budget of a project. Yeah. But in this particular case, they came back to me and indeed they could pay me more. They were just trying to see if I would accept a lower rate, but my editor did fight for the rate I usually ask for and that was great and i really really appreciate that yeah but some yeah. years ago i wouldn't have had the courage to s ask for it right right i think you know it's just a matter of experience and time as well and yes. even though i have very big imposter syndrome still now after being nominated for a nicer award <laughs> right uh, sometimes i'm like well, I can doubt that I deserve being nominated, but that means I'm questioning these people's ability to like 
uh, evaluate work right. and you know their experiences as well and that i'm not going to do because they're professionals and they know what they're doing so maybe just this time they might be right about me <laughs> and stuff like that helps with for example this this company in me feeling comfortable enough to ask for more and to know that i deserve to be paid at least you know the industry standard the the hard part is like there are there are um parts of the industry that don't have a standard um mm -hmm. cartography unfortunately is one of them uh and that is because most cartographers are also illustrators and not necessarily I, I, i'm gonna preface this with that isn't bad i don't mean it like they're not real <laughs> cartographers <laughs> <laughs> before anyone comes at me um i just mean that it's not their main focus of artwork mm -hmm. you know um yeah. and a lot of times that they are just taking what a client is giving them and then just putting it in their style when you do fantasy cartography for a living a lot of it is you taking a lot of lore and information and kind of hopefully uh, applying earth sciences to it and creating something that's in world um so we're such a tiny group of people that that only do fantasy cartography for a living. So there is no industry standard. There's only um, essentially like what a company's standard is mm -hmm. to pay other cartographers, you know. Um, yeah, and I've I've seen stuff like that. For example, I work for the publishing industry as well. So right. fiction books and YA. And I've done maps for them as well. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the different expectations and standards in the two industries, even when traditional publishers pay for like graphic novels and what they expect, the time it's going to take, how much an artist should be paid in comparison to comic book publishers, it's very different. And the, the two industries are pretty close, right? But it's still sometimes they just aren't used to it right and so they don't know they don't even know what the standard rate is right like i uh so uh, we can actually talk about this as well because i i love this um so when i started doing maps for authors so so far i've only worked with a couple of publishing houses which has been a fantastic experience um not that I'm saying that the gaming industry isn't as organized, <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of, it's very chaotic. Lack of a it's better a bit, word. It's different. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so it is. it was so nice to just have somebody message me and say, hey, we're working with this particular author. This is their book. This, you know, gave me all the information. Um, would you be willing to make a map? And here's the price and here's the deadline. And I was like, wow, I got... Amazing. I got everything up front. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to handle this. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and that's that's really different because from yeah, the publishing industry does that, but I also work with comics and games and it's yeah. it's so different. It's yes. it really is. Oh yeah. So, I mean, it's it's still fun though, uh just to see the yes. the difference in uh, I loved the, um, I got into a voice call with one of the publishers and I, I, I was just a little surprised and I didn't, I was so prepared for my normal speech and tell them what I needed and blah, blah, blah. And they already had everything. And I was like, I, amazing. I, I can't say, I, like, I don't, I came in here all ready to fight and there was like no fighting involved. Yeah. <laughs> oh. And sometimes I used to get like sketches from the authors already of what they wanted for the maps and I and they would be like oh I'm so sorry I don't know how to draw but I I just love those sketches and that the people have already thought about doing them and sending them to me and I please don't apologize for ever sending sketches for maps or characters or anything because I love them <laughs> and right, I really right. appreciate them I just started doing a bunch of um, uh, videos of what my clients give me versus what the final map looks like. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, it's, it's so funny how many people are like, oh, my God, that that 
that draft looks better than what I would have done. Let me tell you, first off, I you give me anything, anything. I don't care yeah. how horrible you think it looks. Trust me, any guidance whatsoever for what you want, I am more than happy to work with. But my first maps, let me tell you, we all start somewhere. And my first maps mm -hmm. were horrible. My first drawings were horrific. I don't even know if you could have identified what they were. Uh, and I'm not talking like, you know, being a five-year-old. I mean, as like a teenager going into adulthood, trying to draw something. <laughs> I'm not sure it even remotely came across as to what I thought I was drawing, you know? Um, but what my do you mean you don't, you, you can't be perfect right at the start when you start doing something new. I don't I, I know, understand. right? Like, okay. So the funny thing is I just had a conversation with somebody not too long ago and we we're talking about whether or not somebody is born with a capability of something or versus somebody who has to learn a skill. And I said, nobody's born automatically knowing how to do all this stuff. And I... And they were like, well, you know, well, what about people like Mozart or Beethoven who, who were extremely young and, and started writing symphonies and stuff? And I'm not saying that creativity is something you're not born with, mm -hmm. but honing a skill. Yeah. Mozart's first symphony sounded nothing like his, his refined, well, his refined chaos. Um, <laughs> in and, writing and stuff. Yeah, and I went to music school for 10 years, so I actually studied this. And right. Mozart uh, was trained to be a prodigy, right? Right. That's what his parents wanted him to be. And so all, all he did was train to be a prodigy. And, you know, it was all he did anyway. He might have been creative, but and able to play this and that at six years old and compose something really young, but he also had a lot of training. Yeah. And yeah. he was he was like twenty he still composed like choir pieces called Lick My Butt. So, you know, even Mozart just did <laughs> fun stuff. Yes. He, yeah, he wasn't that's a why genius I said all the his, time. His skilled chaos, because you know, yeah. he was absolutely great yes <laughs> <laughs> oh he was yeah but i but again you know everybody has to you have to practice you have to put yeah. in the time and everything else and again i'm gonna stress there aren't dues to pay it's not like you start an industry um anybody who turns around and acts as if you starting and immediately getting jobs or immediately getting work or whatever is somehow wrong tell them to go fuck themselves yeah. you don't owe dues just because they have been in the industry so long and they didn't get those same types of offers right away or still haven't has nothing to do with you you don't owe anyone shit there are no dues to fucking pay <laughs> and really everyone has mentality. their own experience with stuff right right sometimes you're just at the right place at the right time and things happen right Sometimes you have put in more time and practice than the person who's been supposedly doing it for 10 years. Yeah. They're only doing it on the weekends. You're doing it every day. There's it, it, there's a tremendous difference. And I, I really hate the gatekeeping that goes on in certain industries. I'm really happy to see that, at least with Tabletop, that changed over the past couple of years a lot. Nowhere near as much as it should. But... Hey, I'll take whatever I can get. Yeah. Um, but I, because I actually tried to go out for the gaming industry a long time ago and was essentially told, like, girls aren't in this. <sighs> yep. Yeah. Girls can't and possibly no, understand just, gaming or. It's not how it works, you know. Right. If you're a girl, just you don't know what gaming means. Right. Right. Yeah. And uh, uh, I was, oh, I was actually flat out told by a gaming publisher to just stick with drawing romance novel covers, <sighs> which isn't even what I I drew. I'm rolling my eyes. 
so hard because you see that with like writers as well because female writers can only write romance right or right. young adult or you know surely they cannot write serious proper books like i don't know literary fiction or science fiction or right every book is a serious book okay if you're writing you're a writer yeah Hurrah. yeah that's it your your body parts your um, chromosomes have nothing to do with that <laughs> exactly yeah yeah it's 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 amazing and um it's been really interesting to watch because i just turned 50 and um i i remember pre-internet days and watching especially from a gamer's point of view watching this industry change over the past over my lifetime um because i am as old as D, which is hilarious to me <laughs> Um, it's yep. great because they sent me a 50th anniversary package for my 50th birthday and they didn't even do it on purpose. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, it, it's been, you know, when I very first started basically having DMs take over my characters telling me I don't know how to play, even though I, I didn't do anything yet. They didn't give me a chance. Yeah. Um, yeah being flat out told the girls can't be a dungeon master or whatever it like uh to be completely sexualized going to comic cons because you couldn't possibly be there other than you're a booth babe um like all of these really bizarre things that you're like why are you like this and then to see the internet become what it has and as horrible as parts of it are um it is a, essentially, it is creating a global language and it's allowing us to connect to people we would never even remotely be able to contact before or see their lives yeah. or their cultures or their art. And um, I think that it opened up the gaming industry tremendously and gave us such a direct contact to the audience and the fans of whatever is being created and uh, I don't think that there could possibly be a better way for it to grow and still remain. Like I, I think that I think that D and D would have absolutely died out <laughs> if it weren't for the internet. Yeah. If it weren't for the internet, I wouldn't have had like ninety five percent of the opportunities I've had, right? And I wouldn't know like. 80% of the people I know and the friends I have. Right. So yeah, there are some dark corners to the internet, but I do think like the community that you can find, the communities that you can be a part of will only enrich everything if you, you know, if you choose kindness <laughs> and right. if you are a part of those communities just with the idea and the goal to be kind and make friends and be a part of it. Yeah. Can don't be assume amazing. the worst. Yeah. Don't assume that everyone's there to fight you. Don't assume that something you read is meant with the ill intent you're reading it in. Yeah. Ask. Yeah, it's Did hard you mean to, to sound like an asshole in this comment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's hard to read intentions uh, on the internet, you know, over a post on Twitter or something. So right. don't assume. Just yeah. be nice. <laughs> exactly. Unless people really are being mean to you. Oh, yeah. And, you know. Standard. Unless it's painfully <laughs> obvious, and then that yeah. at that point, you know. Um, but you know, like uh, to give everyone some really good. Um, in case some of my listeners aren't as old as I am, so I used to. <laughs> I used to have to. Um, I would paint a series of paintings on canvas. Um, would have. Um, this is actually how I got into photography. I uh, would have professional um, photos created for them and put into a huge binder and then this binder i would schlep all over manhattan and um uh, local boroughs and to galleries or to agencies and to show them what i could do and hopefully get some of my art hung up in you know in whatever and it was a lot of in-face rejection yeah. Of like, oh, this isn't what we're looking for, or you should, you know, go back to art school, which I've never gone to, so that kind of didn't work. <laughs> um, you know, like, and it would 
it was very, very brutal and it was so time consuming. And then you would, you know, maybe get a break and have something hung up. And then you would find out like the gallery made a ridiculous amount of money compared to what you received. And it's like, oh, wow, you, you take like 70%, you know, and then your, your agent takes another 10, like what the fuck? <laughs> you know? yeah. So, you know, um, and it's just a matter of whether or not they think something, a, a series or a piece is sellable and it has nothing to do with your actual artistic abilities. And it, it was very in your face. Whereas now you, it's a lot easier where it's just like, okay, I sent my stuff in and hopefully I hear back from them. And if not, you know, you don't get to hear how somebody thinks your art sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you do, but it's just a bunch of fucking trolls on the internet. So yeah, who cares, you know? <laughs> right. Saying, why isn't this like that? Yeah. Oh, I, I love those. <laughs> you do? I mean, I haven't gotten a lot of them, but I've seen, I've seen some. Yeah. And I usually just take quiet. <laughs> I, I do because there's, to me, it's hilarious. There's bits and pieces about um, the way that people decide to pick apart whatever, you know, like um, this. I don't think this person was trying to be mean, but it was really funny to me. So I made a map uh, where there is trails, you know, wagon trails that go through. Mm -hmm. In the middle of the trail, I put grass, right? And, if, you know, someone's like, this is great, but wouldn't there be less grass in the middle because of the horses trampling it? And I was like, then you wouldn't know that there was specifically a wagon trail because it's just a fantasy map and it's kind of hard to convey certain things. Mm -hmm. And the point of it was that it was wagons, not any other trails. Um, but like, or, or. And my absolute favorite is everyone wants to tell me how rivers work. Oh, yeah. I've gotten and, that one as well. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because I'm like, no, 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 no. It's not that rivers don't split. It's that they <laughs> rarely split, but they do split. Um, the other thing is like I, what I really love is... Um, when I will get something where someone's like, oh, you know, um, a river went from one ocean to the other. And I'm like, technically that's not a river, but you know, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but also I, I don't know how much, I know the average person doesn't really care about earth sciences, but there's this really cool thing called, um, plate divides <laughs> in which, two pieces of land start to separate over yeah. time and our planet has had super continents numerous times in its history and we're where we have all been one big landmass and then that mm -hmm. broke apart and then formed it again because our tectonic plates are constantly in motion and this occurs even on fantasy planets <laughs> yeah so, you know, your assumption that that huge water divide couldn't possibly be anything but a river that somehow flows in the middle, which is technically possible if there's an underground source, but hey. But also, it's representational, honey. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> things just look pretty. <laughs> right. You it's know, it's you know not meant to be exact. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It's not meant to be exact. It's just supposed to like convey a yeah, general idea. Yeah. yeah. You know, I hate to tell you this, but even our, our modern maps yeah. are not accurate. <laughs> yeah. 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 What's the name of the projection? Oh, I, I used to know this. Oh, which one? The, we have... the one. Yeah, we have several, but the, the ones we usually use now, just, you know, the rectangular one that distorts like... Um, uh, the, well, the rectangular one? No, it's not the meridian. Oh. Um, no, no, because there's one, one. Where, is there, where it's like two circles, right? Right. It's not that one. The one you usually see in like textbooks. Yeah, and hold on. The, the countries are all distorted. Or yeah. the, some of them, most of them, like at the poles and 
stuff like that. It has a name and I used to know it, but now I'm tired. And <laughs> I'm looking it up now because there are so many. And um, I think, I think the most common, oh no, I'm thinking Mercator is what I'm thinking. Oh, uh, yes. Um, I think the one you are referring to is the... Uh, the, uh, oh God, I don't know if I can say this word without botching it, but we're going to try the equirectangular. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and think, it's I the one that the distorts one. the North Pole as yes, we go. Yes, that's yes. the one. Yeah, even, even those maps aren't, you know, aren't the actual truth. Right. <laughs> Right, it isn't how the how the Earth looks from space. Yeah, it isn't how the Earth works. <laughs> right, right. So you know, and it's the other way. Like every, I will get quite a few times, like someone's like, "Oh, when do we get a globe of Alexandria?" And I was like, "Matt and I have already talked about this. Neither one of us want to do the math. The answer is never." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. You know, it is. And uh, and, and the relation I've, to the continents and how much time it takes and. Ugh. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We've we've had numerous conversations about. Um, uh, I I am going to say, you know, if you have the opportunity to work with a cartographer before you start world building, I highly <laughs> recommend it, because we do tell you to have things like an equator, mm -hmm. so we can kind of tell what biomes kind of <laughs> belong in certain areas. <laughs> yeah. We can help with that. Please contact your local friendly yeah. cartographer <laughs> yeah your local fantasy cartographer yeah uh I, and it, it is i've made the joke that that we should have a cartographer um um admins you know for projects just simply because i will be i'll be asked to do a project where i'm like none of this makes any sense why does it look like and i've had it where i've literally gone like why does this look like like you have 10 different writers and each of them wrote a different area and they're like oh we did <laughs> yeah us okay that well, isn't that's <laughs> yeah that's not how that works at all <laughs> let's <laughs> let's talk about this a moment even <laughs> with magical whatever going on that shouldn't work that way um and the other thing is, I don't expect anyone to actually know any earth sciences and stuff like that you know, which is one of the reasons why if if you're going for something that's a little bit more realistic, enough that it doesn't, you know, break immersion, then talk to your, literally talk to cartographers mm -hmm. and find one that, that kind of does what you're looking for. Like, again, I'm going to stress this. I don't draw sci-fi people. <laughs> I draw yeah. high fantasy. If you want a sci-fi map, don't ask someone who's only ever drawn fantasy and that's all you've ever seen there's a good chance they probably don't really connect with that. Um, yeah, or have the experience to give you what you want, right? Right. In the time that you need. <laughs> right. Uh, I am so, uh, I absolutely love drawing fantasy so much that, um, could I draw sci-fi? Sure. Do I want to? Not really. Yeah. <laughs> and, you, you know, know, you'd need more time to like do things properly because of course you want to be proud of your work and right. if you're going to draw sci-fi maps it's a whole nother you would need to do so much different research yes right and it's yeah. a whole thing and it's a whole other setup just artistically it's mm -hmm. it's a different um like one of the things that i love is i now have it so um i have what i call a map template where how I start every map is pretty much already set up in my uh, Clip mm -hmm. Studio Paint. So that would be different depending on different types of maps that I make. But for fantasy, this works really, really well. And I love it. And it has a, the palette that I normally use. It has all my favorite brushes that I automatically use. So it just it ends up a lot quicker that way. And um, so I usually will recommend... <laughs> another cartographer if somebody's like oh we're doing sci-fi great i have the other cartographer for you because i'm not going to do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you know part of being a, a part of being a part of a community is also that because when you know and you work and you get along with other cartographers in this case or artists or colorists 
When someone offers you a project and you can't take it for whatever reason, I I always suggest other people. Like yes. I, my colleagues aren't. I I don't want to see them as my competition. They're like right. they're my colleagues. I'll help them if I can, obviously. So if I can't take a project, I'll suggest this and that colorist or designer or artist, and I'll always try to help other people, which I think. Yep is what a community is for, right? Oh yeah. It it's I get a, a lot from people like, oh, you know, I you know um oh my map of Barovia is a good example. Oh, this is better than the original. No no no. It isn't better. It's, it's different. just different. Yeah. I loved the original. This is how, first off, that's the map that I used when I first played mm -hmm. in Barovia. So mm -hmm. I love that map. Uh but secondly, you know, it's they were drawn for two different reasons and yeah. the original is it by the way the original is by mike schley and it's gorgeous and i love it yes. and i love his work and uh yes. you know <laughs> he's actually who um most people know as wizard's main cartographer beautiful work um but nobody i don't see any other artists or creatives or cartographers as competition it doesn't work that way yeah like there's there's, I can't possibly make all the maps for everybody who wants a map. So I definitely why not, need, Devin? I mean, I, why I know it's you know what it is. It's um, I'm a slacker. Oh yeah, that's yeah. It. I knew I'm it. lazy. I don't. Yeah, uh, I sleep I knew it. all day long. Um, I get up and I do maybe an hour worth of work, and then I go back to sleep. Yeah, typical uh, artist freelancer. Yeah. They're yeah. all the same. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and then I spend the evening drinking wine with a bunch of naked people in my house as we paint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like typical <laughs> artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's us. They all do that. It's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Huge dinner parties with a bunch of naked people who are painting. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I've had somebody yeah. say this to me, which is hilarious. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, I had somebody come over to my house with a friend of mine, and I was like, "Oh, I'm working in the studio today." And he's like, okay. And um, they come into my studio. And, uh, you know, it is it is a typical artist's studio. There's paint mm -hmm. everywhere. There's canvases yeah. everywhere. And I'm standing in the middle of it on top of a, a um, sheet, you know. And I'm covered in paint and painting a canvas. And I've got a painted sandwich next to me because <laughs> I forget I have paint on my hands. And a jar mm -hmm. that I'm hoping is just something I'm drinking and not paint water the water for your yeah right your you know <laughs> and uh his friend was like really disappointed and when they left he was like i was expecting something different and my friend's like what do you mean he's like i don't know he's like she's she's very like she's such a i don't know i just kind of pictured her like a regular artist and my friend's like what what is a regular artist he's like i don't know He's like, I, I thought maybe she would be painting naked or something. <laughs> like, why? Why would I be painting naked? What a weird... Like, first off, paint gets everywhere. Like, that's yeah. why we have smocks and stuff. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, why would you... But also, why do you think that all artists... Like, I hate the movies for this, because the movies did this to us. Yes. You know? It's it made us all drinking wine and naked, you know? No. Mm -hmm. No, it's yeah, cold. No. Yeah, <laughs> artists work during the winter as well. The right, surprise. right. Well, I mean, I you're wish in a we wide could open hibernate. Studio. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Yes. And just come but, back, and everything is still there. Yeah, and the bills have been paid. You know. Oh yeah. Amazing. No. Let us right. live in that world, Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like it if you know what. If movies could be accurate, the one thing that I want them to be accurate with is that somebody will pay me to be an artist, um, pay my rent and pay my bills while I just make art for them. I'm okay yes. with that. Let's yes. bring back Proper the benefactors. Patron. Yeah. Yes. Let's do it. Yes. That's that's what we need. <laughs> mm -hmm. That would solve everything. <laughs> yeah, but then everybody would want to be an artist because nobody wants yeah. to pay their bills. We should just yeah. do away with bills. Yeah, that's it. We've yeah. figured it out. Yeah. 
We yeah. fix the world's problems. Exactly. That's Let's it. do Let's away do with it. bills. Everyone owns the house that they're currently in. Uh, or, you no know, debt. whatever. Right? No, um, nothing. Electricity is free. Water is free. Yes. There you go. Yeah. I should it's be the next done. president. Yes, I'll vote for you, even though we're not in the same country. But you know, I was going to say, I'll you'll have to come here and vote for me. I'll, you know what? If I'll I was be... president, your vote would count. Oh, <laughs> see? There we go. <laughs> All right, so I know that you've you've done coloring and stuff like that. How much writing have you done? And how much of it is is purely you get to do whatever you want with writing? Um, or is it all yours? Is it you working with other people? I've been writing for longer than I've been right. doing anything like graphic design or comics. I used to write as a kid just stories for my classmates to entertain mm -hmm. them, so they would be my friends. Yeah, yeah. I would write these long stories so they would keep listening to me and just, you know, consider me their friend. <laughs> so right. most of the writing I do is just for me. Uh, I am trying to get published and get an agent, but for that you have to query a manuscript and it's a whole process and, you know, Sometimes it doesn't work and you move on to the next project. Mm -hmm. uh, I've recently started writing comics as well. I've I've been, uh, uh, one of my pitches was chosen for a, an anthology that actually is coming out on Kickstarter um, in March. So that's going to be fun because it's going to be my the first collaboration in terms of me writing a comic and then someone else illustrating it and then me coloring it <laughs> that's going to be fun uh <laughs> i've also written like homebrew stuff for my campaign i've published some of it like for free online yeah. but uh i write i mean i i want to write more than i do but sometimes i'm just so tired you know after a day of work right sometimes you know there are not enough spoons if you know the the spoony theory I do. I yeah. am a spoonie. And sometimes you just, you know, you have to accept that in terms of, yeah, I have less energy than someone who is healthy because, you know, I have a chronic illness and chronic pain and it's just what it is. Uh, but I still write and sometimes, you know, writing a little bit every day, even if it's just a hundred words, 500 words means that you have an extra 500 words that you didn't have yesterday and that applies to everything drawing illustrating you know just everything but yeah i do write and i want to publish more things it's just a matter of you know <laughs> finding the time to do all the projects that i want to do because i want to do too many things just hey. all of the things please have you thought about self-publishing I have. Uh, I really want that collaboration and that relationship with an agent. Right. I don't think I would have, because self-publishing is a lot of work. Yes. I technically can do almost all of the steps, maybe not editing and revising, but I do right. know how to write, layout, you know, I could do it, but it's a lot of work. Uh, and I admire people who do it, but I, you know, I might self-publish things like I would like to traditionally publish books as in fiction writing, but right. the games part, I have considered self-publishing. I just haven't had the time to properly uh, explore the option, let's say. Right. I... <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I actually am also contemplating getting back into writing. Yes, um, join us. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's an interesting journey. Um, so I used to write when I was uh, younger, and I've been published in magazines and and um, have had a bunch of stuff under my belt, and then went off and had a whole other career, and then mm -hmm. now have this career. And uh, part of me is like, do I just get back into writing? Which I'm 
definitely contemplating, but I think this time around that um, I am absolutely fascinated with um, I'm I'm absolutely fascinated with where tabletop uh, specifically RPGs are going. I love that we are trying very desperately to share our stories with each other, and I like that actual plays became a thing that we all were heavily invested in. Mm-hmm. But that is kind of shifting again, and nobody knows exactly where we're going to land. But what I'm finding fascinating is how many people are turning that into other types of storytelling. And yes. um, there is a part of me that would like to, instead of writing a traditional book and having something that's that is published in, um, you know, in a uh, uh, in one single format there's a part of me that wants to just write and leave it open for anyone who wants to read it and if you want to support it great become a patron and if not I'm just going to write and put it out there on a regular basis instead of like writing a novel and then editing Mm -hmm. and then you know um I think because part of me feels that um As interesting and as amazing as a lot of novels are, I feel that I don't ever get to connect with the stories the way I really want to. Mm -hmm. Because I'm huge. I I love lore and everything else is a big reason why I'm a critter. And I want to be absolutely immersed into the world. And when you're writing a book and you're talking about characters and stuff, you have to kind of stick to what's going on in the story. You don't get to just magically lore dump in the middle of something. (laughs) Or let me rephrase that. You shouldn't. Uh, That kind of like breaks the story. So please don't do that. Um, But I love, I love the idea of opening up an entire world and then um, telling the stories that are in it. And there's a part of me that wants to, I really want to do this with Legend Keeper. Who's our sponsor? Because I talk about them so every time. Um, And essentially what is Legend Keeper is, if you don't know, is a fantastic tool that allows you to um, take notes, link everything as you're typing them. Uh, it, it's fantastic for building not only a world, but a storyboard and telling your story in a unique way and um, categorizing it so you can actually stay really organized. And uh, that absolutely sounds like a plug, so that I'm okay with that. Um, but I want to create a world on it and invite other people to just come and read and explore at their leisure and then read the stories as I create them, which means that there's going to be a lot of uh, errors. <laughs> that sounds amazing, though. I've had I've considered considered similar things. I've like I've wanted to do multimedia projects in terms of fiction, yeah. as in you would have imagine a podcast, but then you'd also have images or posts on a forum that was also part of the story and yeah. emails you got with clues and stuff like that and involving different mediums to tell a story so i do like that idea yeah then i highly i highly recommend you check out legend keeper i shall yeah it's um what i love about it is there's so many ways to like connect things like a, a perfect example is if you write a character's name, it'll link to the page that you could make for the character. So you can actually have like a character sheet in their mm-hmm. background and or stats if you wanted. I don't know. Um, but also you can have their portraits. You can have their their family tree for that matter, their timeline, uh, a map of their house. <laughs> that sounds you know? super fun and something I would use to just procrastinate actually yes. writing. <laughs> yes. That's, I think that's really what I'm doing is I just want to, I love the world building part. Yes, um, but also, you know what it is? I, I think what I love most is there's a part about when you're reading a story and it's just, you just feel like you are watching a movie in your head or, or mm-hmm. you're experiencing it along with a character. What I dislike is having to wait the time in between books. I yeah. like I I don't want to be taken out of that world. I hate the feeling that I get every time I end a really good book. That emptiness where I'm like, "Oh, 
what now? Right, what that's do I do with my life? Right. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, there's a part of me that actually loves that feeling because that means that I really connected to a book. But then there's a part of me that's like, oh, God, I feel so empty inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I heard apparently writers need to sleep. Why? It's, it's a strange concept. I don't understand it. I listen, don't know. Listen, I can sleep and write when at the same dead. time. Or that, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, <clears throat> this is why part of me is like, well, but if I write a world and other people get to connect it with it, maybe I can get other writers to do something similar. Yes. And then I can just stay absolutely immersed in a world while they're writing their next book. Yeah. It's a good like, idea. I just, I just need all the lore even if it has nothing to do with the character i'm reading i just want yeah, to just know. give me a book with all the lore please because yes i would i would read it i have i have several like lore books on star wars stuff most right. of it it's not even canon anymore but i bought it years ago just to read about this little planet no one knows about and hey. who lives there and just tell me everything please <laughs> That's what I want. And that's what I, that's, I, that's the biggest reason why I'm like, ah, oh, maybe I'm going to, I have a tarot card deck that I'm trying to finish first. That's my first main project. Once that's done, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to end up diving into this world and I'll still be making maps because I'll be making maps for the story and stuff and mm -hmm. illustrations. But I, I really love this idea and I'm going to see if it works. And who knows, maybe so. I'll change the way the industry writes. And then I get all the lore <laughs> right <Yeah>. away. <laughs> I'll be here waiting for all the lore. I'm like the eyes emoji, just yeah. looking and waiting. <laughs> well, I'll be waiting for you to do the same, you know. I well, want to hear. Well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see? want to. I do. See, yeah. Right. I want to. <laughs> <laughs> and now I've said it on a podcast, so it has to happen. I have to write. You're committed now, to it yeah. now. There's no way I around am. it. Th there isn't. No. Nope. Especially once you say it on here, I won't edit it out. You're committed. It's done. Yeah, yeah. You uh, you did it to yourself. That's all I have to say. Yeah. I'm my own worst enemy. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I it's mean, <laughs> ain't that it's the like, truth? Yeah. It's like I want to write, but I don't want to write but i do it's creative brains can be so weird right because you want to do things but then you're scared of doing them and then you won't do them but you want to do them right. all at the same time yeah 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 same but now i've said well, it online so yeah it's over for me you know what we'll do so uh we will we will check back in a couple of months we will set up another podcast and we'll see where we are. Oh no, accountability. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no, anything but that. Oh no. Yeah. 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 Well, maybe we'll it's do it deal. in a year from now because... <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, the tarot card project is huge. It's 90 cards mm -hmm. in total and... Yeah. I'm doing a double imagine. meaning. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a lot, but I really, really desperately want to do it because I've had this idea for almost two years now. And uh, I actually, I mostly want to do it because I turned down a lot of work last year so I could have the free time to do yeah. it now. So I have to because <laughs> yeah, bills. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. 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 So, but yeah. I do hope things work out, though. Then you manage to do it, and it's everything you hoped for. Ah, thank you. I hope the same for you. I hope we yeah, get to see your you. name a lot out there in the world. In all of the places. Yeah, in all everywhere. All the projects. Everywhere, yes. just you know. In lights. <laughs> yeah. On in the, the internet, sky, like but still in Batman. lights. Batman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So is there anything that you can talk about that you're looking forward to doing? Um, let me see. Let me think about what has been announced or hasn't been announced. Right. Um, I, I am looking forward to writing that one shot for the comics anthology. Mm -hmm. And I'm also looking forward for people to see the, 
the last graphic novel for Critical Role that I've done, uh, which has been announced. So I was trying to remember <laughs> if I wasn't going to say anything because, you know, publishing can be so slow sometimes with comics sometimes feels like it's too fast and the deadlines are coming at you too quickly but also you'll finish a project and then you'll have to wait months for people to read it and see it mm -hmm. so i'm excited for people to to get to see what what i've done recently yeah um, i'm excited yeah i, I have also... some of your stuff already oh thank you i do have some of your stuff too <laughs> oh Yay. Yeah, we have to find something we can collaborate on. Yes, please. <laughs> That's all I'm asking. Like people from friends who write or artists mm -hmm. who illustrate. I just want to collaborate with all the people I know, please. Yes, absolutely. Just do cool projects about anything. <laughs> yeah. Pr well, all right. Maybe not anything, but yes. Not sci-fi, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, that too. Yeah, no, I I just mean like I want um, I I want collaborations that feel like genuine collaborations yes. that feel yes. like you know we all get to really add our own uh, flavor to stuff and have our own voice. And there's so many collaborations I've done where it just feels like I'm I'm being told mm. how to add my own stuff and I'm like well this isn't a collaboration this is you hiring me to do something yeah not the same you know so very I, different I projects yeah. oh yeah uh and that's something that I'm hoping that this podcast helps smaller companies understand that if you are hiring somebody to make something don't call it a collaboration uh because a collaboration means I get to add my own stuff in I get to yeah. create as well. That's that's what collaboration means. <laughs> Not yeah. here's what you're making. That's you hiring me. <laughs> Which is valid, but you know, it's yes. not a collaboration. <laughs> right. It's, it's different things. You know, exactly. Yeah. yeah. There's there's a tremendous difference. And um the other thing is is like it's um cuz you know, now I have a bunch of people that try and work with me just for my name and it's mm -hmm. the fact that they're like oh yeah we collaborated with Devin Rue no not you I kind of didn't <laughs> you literally hired me told me exactly what you wanted and then that was it I didn't really get any say in it <laughs> yeah I've so. I've seen I've gotten some emails like that as in after my Eisner nomination, I got some people who wanted to hire me because I was nominated, but they weren't willing to pay me <laughs> yeah. for so, my oh, work. I should, I should absolutely ask about that. Um, real quick, I don't want to take up too much of your day. Oh, um, so I, I'm I, having too much fun. <laughs> I know, <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, so, you know, we do, we see a lot of things, you know, in the industry where, you know, win an award or award winning or whatever. Um, and a couple of years ago, uh, someone asked me to submit my stuff to a, uh, to one of the awards, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember which one anymore. And I was, you know, read the rules and everything. And I was like, wait a minute, you want me just to send you a bunch of free stuff? <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't want to be mean, but like, I can't afford that. I'm a, you know, tiny little creator at the time. And then I was like, so this basically means that if somebody can't afford to send you anything, that you're only picking from what's being sent to you. And that's not the same. Mm -hmm. And this kind of, soured my view of a lot of the um awards and stuff that are kind of in the um in the industry just because it felt too curated it didn't feel like of of the community but the other thing was i asked one of the previous winners like have you ever gotten any work specifically from this you know and they're like no nope. <laughs> uh, so, in, in my case I think I've gotten more offers okay uh, doesn't mean I accepted all of them because sometimes I just don't have the time right. um, 
other times because they were mm, I don't want to say insulting but <laughs> they were sometimes yeah. <laughs> they were yep uh, I did get more offers I think because in my case it just got my name out there and to be fair when I was told that I'd been nominated mm -hmm. again I thought it was a prank I thought my editor was right. surely they got it wrong what do you mean I'm nominated for an Eisen Eisner Award for my first year of work that's that, right. that doesn't make any sense uh, but it, I've suddenly you know haven't gotten major offers or anything I'm not super famous or being right. offered work by everyone and everything and every project I think it helps just because a lot of people probably just didn't know me and right. but they saw my name on that list and they were like huh, maybe you know do they actually say we saw your name on there or we know that you're a Esner winner or nominee excuse me and like did um, they name drop a or? yeah a couple name drops but right. I also saw like a tick in emails on the right. week and the week after, maybe the month after the announcement. Oh, okay, so that's cool. The the timing was suspicious. Right, right. Yeah, I could understand yeah. that. Okay, I mean, okay. I, I can understand wanting to have someone who was nominated for an, an award in your project, right? right? But then just and this applies to any artist or colorist, even if you haven't been nominated for anything. Right. If you want to work with someone, pay them, pay them. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I, just uh, respect them. I very recently had had somebody come up to me and like, we have a budget of like $300. Oh, no. Uh, oh, oh uh, that will get you a small island. <laughs> <laughs> like that, I'm sorry, that's, yeah. Uh, that is not adequate so it works <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? they're like how much do you charge and i was like well it depends on what it is in the project and mm -hmm. do you want color do you want you know like it depends on what you're looking for but most of the stuff i i create i think the the least expensive thing i have is about 650 you know everything else is mm -hmm. pretty much over a thousand dollars all the way up to four thousand yeah, because, you know, it's your expertise and all the time that it takes you right. to make the maps. And your style, your expertise, your experience is why they wanted to hire you in the first place. Right, exactly. And, you know, again, I understand that a lot of people can't afford that. And yes. if someone comes back to me and is like, oh, that's that we can't afford that in the budget, I understand. If, if it's a project I really want to do, I'll work with you. Um, I... I have no problem it's not like it's a you have to pay me this exact amount or you can go fuck mm -hmm. yourself um, but also at the same time you come to me with like a hundred dollars and i'm just what that's yeah nope. and, th and if you're <laughs> hiring artists and they tell you well my i usually ask for this you can answer just well that's not within my budget and right. we'll perfectly understand it and it's better than ghosting us Oh yeah, abs. Which I had, I had somebody do in the most hilarious way possible. Uh, they contacted me about a project. We were going back and forth for like a solid week every day, and then um, they turned around and, and we started talking about price and everything. And they came to me and they like gave me a really low number, and I was like, I would charge you that for all the conversations that we've already <laughs> been having much less to actually start drawing. And when they were like, what do you mean? And I was like, oh, I, I had in the time it takes for us to, to talk about things, to go back and forth. Like, I don't, you don't get, you don't pay me for just straight drawing time. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes in between every project. So that's, you know, which is also work. Right. They were so annoyed sounding <laughs> that I would even remotely consider charging them for that, that they they not only stopped talking to me, but they blocked me on all social media. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. I think, I, I think some people don't really have like 
a good idea of everything that goes into right making art they think you just sit down and bam right photoshop just makes you a map right oh wouldn't that right? be nice you would i, I mean, would turn out so much more work much quicker if that were the case <laughs> Yeah, uh, but yeah, I think a lot of people just don't don't know what goes into making like comics or a map, and some of them are willing to learn, and I appreciate that a lot. And others yeah. will just block you because you told them the truth. <laughs> right, like every every project you do, whether you're a writer or an artist, cartographer, whatever, the time that you're talking to a client, um, whether it's just talking about the project just deciding like what it should look like you absolutely should be taking record of that time and charging people for it yeah. because it eats away at the time that you could be doing other things that do make you money and Don't... without it you can't do the project properly right you know the average project that i do i i've yet to have a project where there isn't 20 hours of me going back and forth talking about things blah 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 you know before i even get to start drawing you know yeah and then there's, there's revisions after as yes well. exactly and anyone who wants you to use your social media uh take the time to make posts everything else you have to add that time in don't give your time away for free because then it you you don't make a living wage even if you are charging the right amount for how much time you're spending creating it if you're not also adding in the time of talking negotiating posting whatever you are losing money yeah so and and that stuff's important because we need to be able to survive